Okay, cool. There we go. Okay, hi. I'm Candace Smith. Uh, I'm a technical sales manager here at RBR. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can follow my cool handle. It's uh, Candace with a C, spelled S E A. Um, it's pretty punny. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, the RBR Concerto 3 CTD, uh, and in particular, um, one that you can actually add on a couple extra sensors to because, like I mentioned, Eric Oliver is our guest speaker today. and He's going to talk about using the Concerto CTD, um, and he's actually going to have uh, a couple extra sensors on his, so I just wanted to kind of bring in um, other instrumentation, and I'm really going to try to focus on why um, this is important for community science, so why you would even want to use some of these instruments for that. So let's get into it. Okay, just a general RBR introduction. Uh, we make a lot of things to measure the blue planet. So we have sensors, loggers, systems, and what we call OEM. So a sensor at RBR is something that doesn't have a battery or memory inside of it. So here we have a dissolved oxygen sensor. Um, a logger is something that has a sensor, memory, and batteries. So here, this is a logger and this is actually the thing that I'm gonna talk about most today. You can see here that this sensor that's here is actually plugged in to this. So now all the data that's coming off of it is actually being uh, recorded and it's being powered through the logger. Um, our systems are, I like to think of it as, you know, we're enabling other platforms to, uh, to have some cool pieces like, uh, like telemetry systems and, and things like that. So uh, you can integrate different parts uh, of RBR products into other platforms. And for OEM, it's uh, essentially we take our sensors and we just change the form factor slightly to fit best into other uh, manufacturers' um, platforms again. But uh, in particular, like this is uh, for a float, like a profiling float that goes up and down. So instead of getting a large logger like this, uh, we supply them just with sort of the sensor part. And um, so here it makes sense for a profiling float. Um, and like I said, today I'm actually going to focus more on the logger part. So um, these are um, just, just some examples of the things that probably you're familiar with as, uh, as customers. So on this end, you can see we have a couple of sensors and how I think of them or how I recognize them really is that you can see the connectors here. So this is oxygen, this is temperature and depth. So these things again would need to be uh, powered and you'd have to have someone to bring the data. These next four white ones with the red are our standard lockers. So they have the memory and the battery inside. They all look kind of similar. You can see some differences there. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but essentially we have small CTDs and then bigger CTDs. Uh, CTD, for those of you maybe who don't know, is uh, connectivity, temperature, and depth. So that's a way to get salinity, temperature, depth, which is all really important for um, just understanding what's going on in the water in general. A lot of organisms are affected by things like salinity and temperature. So sometimes water quality, water health, or fish health um, is directly affected by salinity, depth, or temperature levels. Um, and this last little guy over here is one of our compact loggers. This is actually a solo T, so it's a, a small temperature logger that has memory and battery inside. So um, yeah, so this is just a brief overview of some of uh, our more popular instrumentation. Okay, so this is the RBR Concerto CTD. Um, so again, conductivity, temperature, and depth. Um, so we, I've listed the accuracy here, the, spe the sensor specifications. These are uh, probably the, the highest sensor accuracy on the market right now, I would say. Um, so 0 0.003 microsiemens per centimeter, plus, um, plus or minus 0 0.002 degrees Celsius for the temperature, and the depth is 0.05% uh, FS, which means full scale. So essentially all that's saying is that the shallower a sensor is, the better accuracy it can be. So a 20 meter pressure sensor is going to have better accuracy than a 6,000 meter pressure sensor. Um, yeah, so this particular instrument can take uh, 24 million readings. You can sample really quickly up to 32 hertz. We have lots of different variations of it, fast sampling, deep sampling. Uh, this particular one here that you can see has um, uh, plastic housing. So this unit can go to 750 meters. 
If you go beyond that, we recommend where you have to get a titanium housing and actually Eric's um, instruments are titanium and they can go to 2,000, uh, actually up to 6,000 meters. Uh, it's really, really easy to get data off of these instruments. Um, USB-C, so you literally put, you know, you typically have a USB-A connector on your computer, so it's a USB-A to USB-C, or for those of you with newer Macs, it's USB-C to USB-C, and super easy to get the data off. And uh, it also comes with twist activation and Wi-Fi, which I'm going to talk about in a lot more detail later, so I'm just going to uh, sort of leave that there for now. So, with the concerto, so all of our, our naming conventions mean, um, mean something. So the concerto means three to five channels. And for most folks, that means CTD plus other things or just CTD, but it can be any combination of three to five channels. Um, typically, you see something like this where you have CTD and then a couple of cabled sensors. So in this case, this is the same oxygen sensor we saw earlier and a turbidity sensor. So you have all five channels on the exact same logger, so you have all the same timestamps and everything, which is really awesome. And again, we have deep versions of this, get the data super easy. Um, you can use Twix activation and Wi-Fi. So for citizen science groups, or sorry, community science groups, maybe you're interested in the oxygen levels because there's something happening um, you know, to the oxygen levels in your area, and that's important at that particular location. Uh, turbidity is typically a measure of like, how cloudy the water is or if there's stuff in the water. So uh, maybe you don't want to have a local pond that has a lot of stuff in it if it's uh, like a water drinking source. Um, so again, this is just sort of um, just one particular configuration. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what different sensors you can actually get here. This is just one configuration of many. Maybe you don't need something uh, as large as a concerto. Maybe you want something that's smaller. This is the RBR Brevio CTD. It is the exact same thing as the concerto, except it has less batteries. So um, this is about two uh, soft drinks or soda pop cans tall. So it's uh, smaller. It has the deep configurations. It has, um, in this case, you can see it can be uh, powered and get data off. And this is used typically for custom vehicle integrations um, because, it, because of the size, essentially. Um, yeah. And then we also have, so maybe you actually want something bigger than a concerto. Maybe you need more, uh, more sensors. Maybe you want multiple fluorescent channels, MPH and PAR, which is a light sensor. Maybe you're doing full suite of water quality sensors. So um, this body here is the same diameter as the Brevio. It's two and a half, um, inches so just to give you the, the scale that this is this this head is a little bit larger um but uh, the, as a the, than the concerto um but still manageable in terms of deployment and holding onto it so it's still really easy for um the community science people to use or anyone to use by hand which is really great uh and yeah you can get up to 10 channels on on the maestro so maestro means typically more than five um five sensors, so five to 10 is usually what we think about. And um, I listed some of them here, but I'm gonna go into more detail uh, right now. So um, I, um, I'm gonna talk about some of the sensors that we integrate onto the Concerto and our, in any of our loggers, um, or our, our standard loggers. If you see something that's not on this list and you're interested in it, just ask us if we have it. This is not a complete list. This is just some of the more popular sensors that we have. Um, so just always ask. And if we, don't, if we don't integrate a particular sensor, perhaps we know another company that can, uh, we can give you the details of that you can ask them if they have the sensor. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first one is the dissolved oxygen sensor. If you write to RBR asking about oxygen, dissolved oxygen, or optical dissolved oxygen, this is typically what we're going to suggest. Um, so um, there, I put all the specs on this uh, as well, but I'm just gonna actually focus more on these details on the right here. So there's three different flavors of it. So here you can see this is a, a sensor again. So we're gonna connect this into say the concerto. It has a pressure sensor, oh sorry, a temperature sensor and um, oxygen foil here. And there's three different versions. So we have a fast, a standard, and a slow. And the sensor is exactly the same except this foil is different. The fast is used for profiling. So profiling is typically when you go and you uh, 
So for community scientists, they probably go deploy by hand or maybe a, winch, a small winch system, and you do a profile of the water column to see what's going on you know, at the surface, near the bottom, in the middle. So that's what profiling is. And typically, you want a fast response on your oxygen sensor and typically for all your sensors to get a really good, um, a really good resolution through the water column. And then we have a standard response. I think that's more used for, say, ROVs that are moving. Uh, they're not stationary, but they don't need the one second response. And then a slow version, and this is really used for um, more deployments. It's that you can leave the logger in one spot, say at the bottom, to measure dissolved oxygen concentrations for a, a while. And um, that foil is actually the thickest foil of the three, so that's why it responds um, slower. And that foil, because it is so thick, it can actually be white. Um, Yes, and it's optical, the optical part means it's, this is a, a light-based sensor, so there's a light inside that flashes when it's taking a sample. So that's one, so oxygen, which again, you, if you think about it, um, a lot of different organisms um, rely on oxygen <laughs> in the water, so it's a, it's a great measurement to have. Uh, we also have uh, different fluorescence and turbidity sensors. Uh, we don't manufacture any of these at RBR. There are third-party sensors that we purchase and integrate, but they're very common. Lots of different uh, folks use them. Um, I'm going to talk about C point up here. So again, you can see this is a sensor. It has a connector on it. Um, this is their turbidity sensor. Again, it's optical. You can see there's two different uh, panels here for the light. Uh, they also do chlorophyll uh, fluorescence and UV sensors. We have the Turner Cyclops here. So the light. Um, the sensor element is actually on this side, this edge that you can't see. This is the most common, I would say, uh, chlorophyll A sensor that RBR integrates. Uh, they also have things like CDOM, FDOM, uh, rhodamine, phycocyanin, phycoetherin. They also have, do this in turbidity, uh, and it's all the exact same uh, sensor. It looks, they all look like this, um, and it's just they're just changing the light, essentially. Um, again, like chlorophyll, that's really a measure of, you know, how much... Uh, Phytoplankton is in the water, typically is what people use that for as a measure of, say, water quality. And lastly, we have over here on the side, this is the wet labs, um, equal puck triplet. So this is three sensors in one. So it's say in three light sensors like chlorophyll and backscatter, and backscatter can give you information on, um, again, like the water clar clarity is a good example. Um, this is a really popular sensor because you can get three channels all in one, and then you can stick to the um, two cabled options on the on the concerto so that you it's it's a little bit narrower than the uh, maestro. Um, and the last couple of sensors I'm going to talk about are the pH. So this is a pH uh, sensor here from Idronaut in Italy. Um, again, most people understand what pH is. Um, it's a, again a good indication of sort of water health, and uh, ORP, which is um, uh, it's another chemical sensor essentially, um, oxi oxidation reduction potential. Uh, and we have PAR sensors. PAR measures light. So here we have two different versions. One you can get light from all angles. So if you can imagine this was facing up, you'd also be getting light that's coming from below, um, which is great because you're getting it from all the different angles. And this one is just measuring, obviously, from um, sort of uh, one plane or a little bit more of a narrow area, more of a cone of light around. Um, and this one's really great because it can be white. So depending on your application, uh, again, maybe if you're, if you're somewhere that you're expecting lots of growth, so things are going to grow onto the sensor, you probably want to get the, the flathead one so it can actually be white. So that's sort of the sensor over you. Um, again, we have lots of other sensors that can be integrated. You just ask us and we can chat a bit about it. So for um, community-based science, I also want to focus on the twist activation and the Wi-Fi because you don't have to be a full-fledged PhD scientist to operate these instruments. They're really easy to use. They're really user-friendly. Um, so the twist activation is literally what it says. You twist it from the pause to the run. Um, it's on all standard loggers. It comes with it. It's the, so a standard logger is a white logger with that red end cap. Um, it's shipped so that this twist activation is, act, is activated. <laughs> so as soon as you take it out of the box, if you twist the end cap, it's going to start recording right away. And this twisting um, actually turns the Wi-Fi on, which leads me to this page. So 
why would you need Wi-Fi on these things? Um, the Wi-Fi is a great way, once you've done a deployment, to get the data off of the logger once it's back sort of on dry land or back onto the ship, to get the data off without having to open up the logger in the field. So uh, let's say you are doing work on a community science um, group, and maybe there's fishermen on a boat who are doing these deployments for you. It's just so much easier for them just to take the logger, twist the end cap, and get the data off without having to open it up, check the O-rings and desiccant and batteries and all that kind of stuff. It's just, um, yeah, or for anyone that's not super used to doing those things, or but it's even great for people who are used to doing those things because it's a pain in the butt to have to deal with that stuff. Um, it's also really awesome to look at the data in real time or, uh, or essentially, essentially real time or really quickly. So maybe you do a profile and the data, and then you bring the logger back to the surface. You want to have a look at the data. Like, is it, you know, is it warmer near the surface, near the bottom? Are we seeing um, changes in oxygen, for example? And it's also super flexible. Um, our software runs on uh, Mac and PC, and the Wi-Fi actually works on uh, the, sorry, Ruskin, which is our free software anyone can download at any time. It works on phones. We have a mobile app. Uh, iPads, computers, you can actually use the Wi-Fi through, um, through a computer. It doesn't have to be on a mobile app. And I'm just going to give, I'm almost done, I promise, <laughs> a quick overview of the mobile app. So here there's, um, this is literal screenshots from my phone. So here it just, this is that I've downloaded the app, I've connected to it with an instrument, and you can see it's telling me things like how many samples I've taken, if I'm paused or if I'm actually running, how fast I'm sampling, um, some of the data, and then I can like add GPS tags, which is really useful. I can um, swipe my screen over to a different tab and I can look at all the data sets and some GPS tracks. Uh, so here you can see I did a GPS track sort of around a pond that I like to walk around here. So your phone acts as a GPS um, because it has GPS on there. So if you are sampling, you can actually get tracks um, of uh, GPS tracks, essentially of where you've done your deployments. And in this case, you the all of these numbers actually refer to a profile that was done. And you, if you look really close, you can see there's a couple of different colors. So it tells you uh, the upcast and the downcast. So an uh, the downcast is when you're kind of sending the logger down, and then the upcast is when it's coming back up. So that's that. Um, okay, that's all the stuff I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, this, our next two webinars after today, next week, is the team from Georgia um, Institute of Technology. The team is going to be talking about this really cool. Um, robot basically that they have uh, and they've done their research in Antarctica which is super interesting and then in a couple of weeks we're going to learn more about community science with uh, an awesome researcher out of Hui, Glenn, who's going to talk about his, um, his work with a uh, fisheries group there which is going to be really fun and super awesome. Uh, if you have any questions or anything struck your fancy today you can um, email or call us um, there. And I'm going to stop talking now. Okay. Um, Eric Oliver, are you there? Hello. I Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Um, everyone, this is Eric. Sorry, I'm just getting my questions for you on my phone. Sorry. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, this is really fun for me because Eric and I were in grad school at the same time. Uh, when I was in my master's, he was doing his PhD and we're from the same province, essentially. So I'm from the island of Newfoundland and he's from Labrador. So that's always been uh, fun. Um, so Eric, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you are right now, not physically or sure physically, but your institution and um, yeah, that'd be great. Sure, so I'm um, Eric Oliver. I'm an assistant professor in oceanography in the Department of Oceanography at Dalhousie University, where I've been since 2017. Before that, I was doing a postdoc at the University of Tasmania in Australia. And before that, I did my PhD at Dalhousie, which is where Candace and I know each other from. And right now I'm sitting in Halifax, well, Dartmouth, I should say. <laughs> and can you tell us a little bit about um, this project that you're gonna talk about? Just maybe a quick overview. Sure, so as Candace mentioned, I'm from Labrador originally and um, I went away at 17 to go to university and and now since I've been back in this 
uh, or I've, I've been in this position as a professor at Dow, um, I've been endeavoring to try to bring some of that science back to my home communities in coastal Labrador. And so this project today is one of those initial, initial steps in that direction. So can we go about measuring the coastal ocean in a way that um, is, is based from and involves the communities um, in, a, in a deep and meaningful way? That's awesome. Uh, and specifically, can you tell us what did you do, like how you were involved in the project? Right. So um, I'm the lead. So what I'm going to talk about today is a small seed funded project, basically a year long seed funded project that's growing into a larger thing. And, and I'll touch on that larger thing as well. Um, and so my role in that was really to um, work out what what kind of basic instrumentation we could we could use to do coastal ocean measurements. And um, and I happened on a number of groups around the rest of the north doing similar work where the ice is used as a platform to go out and measure the ocean underneath it which to people who grew up in the north it's obvious to use as the ice as a platform but from an oceanographic perspective that's uh, an interesting twist and so the idea was to uh, um, get in get a ctd an rbr ctd <laughs> and go out and um and measure the ocean around in this case around the community of maine um, cool with community members and trying to measure where and when is, is interesting to people and the last thing I want to ask you is, can you tell us a fun fact about yourself that maybe people on the call don't know? Sure. Yeah. So I was trying to think about this. And anyway, here's what I came up with. So I've recently I've been um, learning a lot about sea ice from a, from a physics, from an oceanographic perspective. So I'm learning a lot and thinking a lot about sea ice dynamics and thermodynamics. And part of that is learning about melt ponds. I've been spending time thinking about what melt ponds are. It's when, when ice and snow on the surface of the ice melt and you get a pool of water. And I've been thinking about that analytically and then it hit me what growing up in Labrador, we used to go to our cabin on Lake Melville in, in um, Easter time. Sometimes we go for a couple weeks. Parents would take us out for an extra week of school so we could spend two weeks out on the land, which was great. And um, sometimes the weather is warm enough that you could actually, I remember with my brother playing in melt ponds like we would go in our in our snowmobiles we would drive alongside a melt pond and jump off into the water um, and play in the melt ponds which would be a lot of fun and get us very wet and i just clued in yesterday that oh while i'm thinking about these things analytically and physically i actually have some personal experience with them as well which is kind of kind of interesting to me it is that that that's a great fun fact i really like that that was awesome cool all right i'm gonna let you take over so you can start sharing your screen and uh yeah we can get right into it all right share. so can you see i can slide? see your screen yep that's great all right so today i'm going to talk about as i mentioned community-based observing of the coastal ocean in nunatsiabut so nunatsiabut is the uh, Inuit region in Northern Labrador, one of the four self-governing Inuit regions in, in Northern Canada. So this talk will outline some of the pilot activities of community-based observing here. And this, were, as I mentioned, is initially funded as a small seed project from the Ocean Frontier Institute, or OFI. If you hear me say OFI, that's what that means today. And it's feeding into part of a larger research consortium that's kicked off this past spring, actually, a project called Sustainable Nunatsiawit Futures. So I guess I don't need to introduce myself, since I've, Candace has done a great job doing that for all you guys. Um, I would just like to point out that while my name and university is on this title slide, I, I really want to emphasize that this is um, not, not just me on here. This is a broadly collaborative approach. And so I'd, I'd like to recognize Clark Richards at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, who's partnered with me on basically teaching a modeler and a climate person how to do observational oceanography, which is great, um, as well as the Nazi Road Government Environment Division, um, notably Rod Lang, Paul McCartney, um, and uh, the Ocean Frontier Institute, and of course, community members in Maine, and who specifically I'd like to mention, Shane Anderson, uh, Joey Yangnatuk, and uh, Joe Webb. So the ocean and climate in the Labrador region are changing rapidly. Um, we've seen two degree air temperature rises in, since the 1990s and significant changes in sea ice cover. And so there's a need to monitor these changes, but observations in coastal Labrador are sparse to say the least. And especially if you can think of observations outside the, uh, rather observations during the ice covered seasons. 
And the ice-covered season is typically considered a shipping hazard from an oceanographic perspective, but for Labradorians or anyone else from the north, um, it's obvious that ice facilitates travel. And so understanding the ocean during, this, during the ice season is important. Local communities in the north are feeling the effects of climate change directly in terms of changes in their ability to travel on the ice or different kinds of species available for harvesting um, and can monitor the ocean state using the sea ice as a platform, which comes very naturally. So the community-based monitoring from the perspective of this project will combine with external funds and gear, which I'm bringing to it with this external funding from Ocean Frontier Institute, Dalhousie, it can achieve these goals um, and fill a couple of data gaps from an oceanographic perspective, being the coastal and the inner zones of the Labrador region and also seasonally during the ice cover season. There's also a great opportunity here for two-way knowledge exchange between the scientific way of doing things where you fly in with your sampling plan already arranged and um, a local perspective on what and where and when is important uh, to measure but also important culturally and socially. And so this can lead to the co-development of research. And importantly, the research should certainly address community concerns, interests, and pri priorities. And those last two points won't form a huge part of what I talk about today, but they're really important um, in guiding how to take this kind of work uh, into the future. So here, you see um, the region of interest. So the left panel is showing the Labrador Peninsula, and you can see schematically the basic ocean circulation shown there where we have um, Arctic-derived waters, um, Atlantic and Arctic-derived waters moving southward along the Labrador Shelf. And the basic structure there is that those three currents coming in, the Hudson Outflow, Baffin Island, and the West Greenland Current, essentially are structured in that order as you go from the coast out. So the, the coastal most waters are most linked to the Canadian Arctic. So you can consider the coastal Nanatsiavut waters to be um, basically Arctic derived waters. In the middle, there's a zoom in on the southern, south, southern central part of Nanatsiavut, including the five coastal communities. So my family roots are just northeast of that Rigolet community in the south there. And you can also see how the, the Labrador Current is split into the main and the inshore branch. So that inshore branch of the Labrador Current is, is an interesting feature that can interact with the coastal zone. And this work took place around the northernmost community of Maine. And it's, and it's interesting to note the, that this region oceanographically is quite interesting. There's a complex archipelago all around the community to the north and the south. And the general feature, geographic feature is that we have these deep fjords cutting west to east into the mountains that are to the west and then out into the um, the open ocean to the east and the typical edge of the of the land fast ice what's called shina in labrador and Nittitut, is shown schematically there as the as the gray line so the methods undertaken here for this community-based work is to partner with, with communities in Nunatsia, but in particular with the Nunatsia government. Um, their environment division is based in Nain, so that was a natural place to start getting this work moving. And to make use of the land fast ice to access the coastal ocean. So the idea is to take measurements of the coastal ocean with CTDs from the land fast ice. So the image here shows um, an idea of the system we're working with that is not Nunatsia with sea ice, that's actually lake ice not far from Halifax where this system was, was tested. So that's a picture of testing the system. Um, so casts are performed through an augered hole in the ice and we use an RBR Concerto 3 CTD exactly like what um, Candice was speaking, out, speaking about. Now the one that's in, the one that we use is not the, the, the one picture on the left. We use a titanium body and it doesn't have extra sensors, just has uh, um, conductivity and temperature. Um, I find these are great to use in remote communities. They run on AA batteries, which are easy to find, and, um, and they have the Wi-Fi communication, which can work really well for transferring data, as well as checking on the, the, um, the status of your casts as you're, as you're out in the field. We use a fishing downrigger, which is shown there attached to that plywood platform. Um, it's basically like a giant rugged fishing rod. Um, 
with 120 meters of 150 pound test line to lower and raise the CTD. We tried both metal cable and synthetic braid and both worked well, but I would say I prefer the synthetic braid as it's just easier to work with than taking on and off the, the downrigger and it's lighter as well. Now, the, the field method we developed and used for the main um, um, set of data I'm gonna to show today um, is use the, the, the Wi-Fi app to communicate with the CTD in the field. And we're, we're revisiting that method as there's, sometimes there's issues with that method. The, um, some, if you're in the field and, you're, and your, your phone can't connect to the, through the device, you need, to have a, you need to have a way of recording your position. And so we're supplementing that method with simply taking another GPS out of the field and um, recording, recording locations and track via an independent GPS to cross-reference with the data. Additionally, most of the work I'm going to talk about was done in spring or, or also in fall via small boat. But if you want to do this in February and it's minus 20, minus 30, you're not going to pull out a, a phone. And if you do with your bare hands, it's not going to last very long in terms of battery. So there are limitations with the... Um, with the smart device method. So this is a schematic of where the pilot project field work was done initially. So this is, you can see Nain there in the middle with the blue circle. And it was done in April 2019 during the spring. So there's still land fast ice covering most of where this map shows at that time of year. And the basic structure is the archipelago, as I showed you, with the Labrador Sea to the east and and that main Nain Bay, which is a, an important region for people in Nain as a char fishing region, the upper part of that bay links to the Fraser River, which is coming down out of the mountains to the west. The dots here indicate all spots where CTD casts were done. And um, this line here indicates some that were strung together to make a transect, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So we can divide these. Um, this set of data into a number of different categories. So we have some samples taken up in the Fraser River, which is basically a fresh to brackish gradient, and I will talk about that later today. We have this main name based Strathcona Run Fjord uh, transect, which runs from that brackish output of the Fraser River out to the nearly open ocean, where we can start to send some Atlantic Atlantic water. We have areas of open water in the sea ice, what you might call a polynya, or in, in local Labrador English, it's known as a rattle, or um, inganik in, in, uh, in Niptut. So there's the big rattle, which is that green one in the north, in Ganyaluk, and then another open water in the orange, shown there to the south. So these are shallow regions with very high flow. Um, and then there's another complex of sites to the south, the two mile, 10 mile of Nita Bay, which I won't talk about those today. So this is some photos of what the field work looked like in April. So at the, at the top there, you can see the spectacular weather that was on um, going on in April um, 2019. Almost every day for the couple weeks that this was going on it looked like that. We did have a few foggy days, but mostly it was beautiful. That top shows Iceberg Island, not far from Maine, and the, and the skidoos supplied by the Nazi government. On the bottom left and bottom center, you can see undertaking CTD samples and that the woman in the picture is Chaim Anderson. Uh, she lives in Maine and she's actually continued to work on this kind of work with us in the phase two Ocean Frontier Institute Research Consortium that's moving this work forward. You can see there substantial snow cover on the ice up to two feet and, and then ice thicknesses below that were up to six feet. So the substantial amount of snow and ice we had to get through in order to get to the ocean underneath. And the bottom right there is showing uh, Joe Young Natuk, who's our trusty guide also from Maine, testing ice thickness around one of the local um, rattles. That was one of the foggy days. So a, a quick run through of our, of our methods, um, our protocol and, and data processing. So at each location after augering a hole, um, and, and clearing the slush out of the hole. Three casts were taken at that location with an initial quality control by eye, and I'll show you what I mean by that. And at this point, there hasn't been any dynamic corrections done on the data. I think the previous RBR webinar spoke about dynamic corrections. Um, and this data were then uh, bin averaged into regular bins in the vertical, in this case, 0.25 meter bins, and then finally, 
an average across all of the quality control profiles at each location were done to create a kind of final local average vertically binned profile. And that's, you can see that as the black dots shown here, black lines and black dots shown here. I would like to apologize for the log scale. I think that's not, that's not normal from a physical oceanography perspective, but there's so much detail in the, in the near surface region that um, it's really a nice way to see the detail in, in the upper ocean. And really this, this work is calling out for someone to, a student or someone with, um, with time to come in and, and think hard about a lot of these, do the dynamic corrections, for example, and, and, and process the data and present visualizations of the data that's much better than what I've done, which is just a sort of quick and dirty initial cut. This is an example of what I mean by the quality control by eye. So the left plot, you can see salinity profile. Um, two profiles were very similar to each other. They're underlain by that black line. And the other profile shown in yellow was off by pretty much a constant negative two grams per kilogram. And so that's obviously something is not correct. So that profile was simply rejected. Um, but I would like to sort out why sometimes profiles have that have that happen. And I have seen the CTD come up with a little pebble or something just resting on the guard. And so that there could be interference with the conductivity sensor in that regard. So further data processing involves trimming the top one and a half, one and a quarter meter and the bottom half a meter. And so this was done because the surface, when augering a hole, you essentially churn all of that ice into the water. And so the, the top meter, meter and a half, depending on what you influence with the auger, part of the water column is not going to be representative of what's, what the ocean would be, would be like um, under stable, unaugered ice conditions, let's call it. So rather than trying to deal with that data that's representative of a mix of ocean and ice, we simply reject the top one and a quarter. And bottom, knowing where the bottom is, is difficult with this method because we're going to unknown locations. We're on the ice. We don't know how deep it is. Um, there's ideas of putting weights on the, on the bottom of the CTD to, to just to find the bottom. But if you're descending at a meter, meter and a half per second, it's really hard to, to make that work. So we essentially have the CTD drop into the bottom. And when it stops moving, we, we bring it back up again. But that does mean that we do get bottom values affected by the bottom, whether it's mud or, or whatever's in the bottom. So we reject the very bottom part of the data. There's some potential fixes to both of these issues. And I would say you could cut the hole the day before and let the system relax to a stable state in order to um, get a better surface profile. You, we're also exploring a longer guard on the end of the CTD so that the CTD can go into the bottom while still maintaining a significant distance between the bottom and the sensors. So this is a first cut at a transect along the Nain Bay Strathcona run line. So I'll just skip back to the map to show you where I mean. So that's this red circled area. So the leftmost part of the plot I'm showing um, is this westernmost part of this line. And then as we run down the line, we go through Nain Bay, through Strathcona run out to the eastern end, getting close to the Labrador Sea. And I do note that there's a couple of ASL folks on the call. So Todd and James, and you might be interested to note that where the, the Ips mooring that you guys helped to put out with the Nets of the Government is also somewhere around the end of this line. So it's quite possible that that data and this data can be, can inform each other. Right, so this is the um, temperature on the top, salinity on the bottom, river input on the left or west, and the open ocean to the right or east. And you can see clearly the Fraser River inputting relatively warm and fresh water um, into, into the region. So this is during spring melt. And the Nain Bay itself region is very strongly stratified by salinity. Of course, we see a, a range, a, quite a big range of salinity in the bay, but then as we get out to the, to further to the east, we get into more what you would call oceanographic salinity conditions. And the waters generally get colder and saltier. And, and I would note that as we go further to the east, the Salinity maintains a strong 
or a moderate anyway vertical gradient, but the temperature becomes more uniform in, in the vertical direction. And we'll see signs of that later when we see um, signature of Atlantic water in the easternmost sections. This transect was revisited in September 2019, and um, repeat casts were performed by a small boat. So this is, um, this is that same iceberg island shown on the left and a small boat, uh, Joe Webb's small boat, and you can see the same downrigger system being used here. There's challenges to doing this by small boat. We have um, a non-uniform descent rate of the CTD since the uh, ice gives us a nice platform that's fixed relative to the solid earth, whereas the boat, the ocean, and the solid earth are all moving relative to each other, so it makes for a much more difficult system. And there's also, it's also much harder to repeat casts in the same location because inevitably the waves and the wind and currents will cause a drift uh, in, in, the, in the location of the boat. But this is what the transect along that same main base Strathcona run looks like from September 2019. And just some quick takeaways from that, as we can see, much less variation in the salinity in this region. Um, and, and now Nain Bay, interestingly, seems to be sequestering a fair amount of very cold water at, at depth. We can also see potentially some, some relatively warm intrusions of salty water at depth to the east. So if you look all the way to the right on the temperature plot, you can see some warm water um, in, um, in, in coming in there around, is that about 30, 30 or 40 or 50 meters depth? Of course, we are subsampling the tides, which could cause a problem, but there's also interesting features at the surface where you see some patchy warm water all along the surface, which could either be effects from the tides and or inflows from some of the channels linking this run to the adjacent um, um, fjords and, 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 and inlets around the region. And this is the difference between September and April. So September minus April. So it's basically showing us how have things changed from the spring through to the fall. And the whole region is warmed by about five degrees Celsius, except the deeper waters in Nain Bay and the, the system is mostly freshening, except the uppermost part of where the Fraser River is coming in. So basically that freshet has moved out into the, the main part of the bay. And it's interesting that that deep water there in, in Nain Bay appears to not have changed very much between these two seasons. It's potentially sequestered from seasonal changes. Again, the, the site, the, the, the transect was visited again in May of 2020. Um, I was not present for this. So this was a, a combination of the United States government environment folks and, and Joey Angnatuk, who was helping in April as well. So they revisited the same site so we can get a repeat of that same transect. And um, this is a one month later than the 2019 spring. And what's interesting is we can see that that warm and fresh pulse from the river appears to have moved out a bit more into the bay barring any other interannual changes, of course. So that's potentially indicative of that um, regular seasonal change of the pulse, of the, of the freshet pulse. And the temperature structure, though, at depth is quite different from April 2019. Where here in Nain Bay, we have extremely cold waters at depth, whereas in 2019, we had our coldest waters out towards the Atlantic Ocean. So there's some interesting interannual changes in the system as well as, as the seasonal, seasonal changes in the system. So I mentioned that um, cold, that storage of cold salty water in Nain Bay. So this here is showing transect or profiles of salinity and temperature from April in blue and September in red. And you can see that um, there's a secondary picnic line down there around 50 meters, which is potentially isolating those deeper waters in Nain Bay from from seasonal changes, which could, could be quite interesting in terms of the, the water properties, the, uh, other aspects of water properties in the system in terms of biogeochemistry. If we go, if we look further out to the east, um, we see potential signature of, of Atlantic water inflow. So just, just inside the outer sill here, um, and you can see the, the line, contours of constant temperature and salinity kind of following in under this sill, on the inside of this sill. Um, we can see waters obviously getting 
colder and saltier as we as we go to depth. But there's a slight, if we look at the, the, the TS diagram, there's a slight uptick at the bottom where we get uh, slightly warmer waters near the bottom that are still quite salty. So this looks like it may be evidence of, of Atlantic water inflows, dense Atlantic waters flowing into the system. And this is evident in both April and also again in, in September. And in the Fraser River, so I will just go back again and show you where I mean by the Fraser River. So this blue circle here, I've only shown one dot, but actually a number of locations were, were sampled in the Fraser River from west to east over a fair, fair range, probably five or 10 kilometers or so along that river. And so the structure of that, oops, the structure of that river is that um, there's a main sill separating the river from Nain Bay, but then there's also a series of sills as you go up the river. And in between the sills are relatively quiescent, uh, deeper spots. And so profiles were taken in those deeper spots. And you can see uh, salinity and temperature profiles here with the colors from brown up to blue indicating further up river or higher numbers to lower numbers indicating further up river. And so not surprisingly, as we go further up river, we get pressure water and we get um, warmer water, uh, taking note of the freezing temperature of water as a function of salinity, of course. Um, although it's interesting to note that some of these downstream locations, and this is particularly true if we look at salinity, some of these downstream locations, so red, purple, brown, we're seeing significant stratification and fairly high levels of salinity at the bottom, approaching what you might call marine uh, salinity levels. And it, it was noted by Joe Yangnatuk, who was taking us around, that it's, it's possible to ride the tide, as he put it, over, over these sills, especially the first couple sills. So that's indication that there's probably some freshwater, saltwater exchange via the tidal currents between Nain Bay and the river. And that's likely what's, um, what's driving these, these salinity profiles. There's some issues with the data and the methods as we've, as we've um, um, put it together so far. So there are cast-to-cast -cast differences. So if you remember when I outlined the methods, we take multiple casts at the same location and after some basic quality control, do a profile average across those casts. But sometimes we do see significant differences that are not, wouldn't be flagged as a quality control issue, but just simply a difference between casts. And that could be indicative of some interesting dynamics happening at fast time scales. And um, this one shown here could be indicative of, of internal waves riding on the uh, picnic line. The descent rate is about one to one and a half meters per second, quite constant actually. We let it free fall, just given the friction of the, um, the downrigger and drag on the water. And that works well for the ice covered season, but during the, when using a small boat, you get rocking in the small boat, if, especially if it's wavy. And so you get a non-steady uh, descent rate. And we haven't yet investigated the influence of that on the data, but that's something that, that needs to be taken into account. And all of this data processing has been done in Python and I personally would like to would like to see an open an open source community driven Python code base for analyzing our BRCTD data. I, I know that there is a there is a Pi RSK tools I believe, but I don't think it's being maintained anymore. Um, there's MATLAB and our, and our packages, so I think there's an opportunity here for for Python users to 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 um to come together as a community and put together some code to to um to analyze and process these data. So future plans with this, um, as I mentioned, this was a one-year pilot project that's built a bit into the, into the second year. It's now kind of rolling into a major four-year plus project that's part of a Ocean Frontier Institute Phase II Research Consortium. So it's funded by the Ocean Frontier Institute with, with ex other support from the Canada Foundation for Innovation and Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs, which are providing some money for, monies for equipment. And partnerships are in place with Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Nunatsia with government, and many others, including other people doing community engaged research across the North, both, both in Canada and in, in the States, in Alaska. And there are some refinements that we and, and I would like to see with this. So we're definitely adding biogeochemical sensors to these CTDs. We have CTD plus pluses, exactly what, what 
Candace described. So we're adding oxygen, turbidity, chlorophyll, and CDOM measurements. And we also have light sensors. That's, that's very critical for the ecosystem, especially in spring, depending on what the ice and snow conditions are, that the spring bloom can be limited by light. We, very easy one to add will be sea ice measurements when you auger a hole, simply measure the, measure the thickness of the sea ice, as well as snow thickness. We'd like to do uh, plankton net toes and in a way that doesn't require complex cutting of large holes in the ice. So we're investigating how to put together collapsible, collapsible plankton nets that can come up through a regular auger sized hole. Um, and there are a number of other kinds of uh, in, uh, endeavors that we'd like to add to this. So doing small boat surveys with an ADCP to measure currents in some of these regions, making ice moorings with thermistor spit strings. And I would really like to see stations installed on the piers in small communities to generate long time series of temperature and, and, um, and tidal heights, sea, sea surface heights via pressure. I think I'll skip over this mostly other than to say that this work is, is linking with a bunch of other related projects that are ongoing. Um, surface drifters are being deployed along the Labrador coast. Um, there's glider work that's happening between the Nazi, with a, as a partnership between the Nazi government and, and Oceans North. Um, there's, a, there's mapping of Inuit knowledge of the coastal ocean and, and ice that I've been involved in, but there's also a lot of historical efforts that have, that have undertaken that. And we're really interested in trying to pursue not just mapping of the same multi-generational or, or, or traditional knowledge, but also regular annual community observations, which is a slightly different kind of knowledge. And there's a numerical ocean modeling efforts that are underway being developed. And a lot of this data is actually all available up on this website, conorc.ca. And the last thing I wanted to mention was that this, this kind of work um, is well suited for outreach with um, with community members so this is an example of an on the land workshop that i participated in in september of 2019 where youth and elders and researchers went out to this small cabin that's jenny and, and buddy mercaret took their cabin not far about a 40 minute boat ride from name and we could sit around a cabin and have tea and talk about about science and what we're and research and what we're concerned about and what we're interested in and what we know and these, these RBR CTDs made for a, a very simple demonstration where um, I was rowed out in front of the uh, cabin. The water was six meters deep. I managed to do a CTD cast and came ashore and could, we could look at the data right away and see, the, see what the stratification was like right in front of the cabin. So it was a, a really nice kind of direct way to do, to do outreach with the community. And so with that, that's all I had to say. So I will hand it back over to Candace. That was awesome. I really enjoyed that, Eric. Thank you. That was great. Um, I believe we do have a few questions that came in. I'm just going to read them out loud just for the video purposes. Uh, also, people who are attending, feel free to turn on your mic and your video to say hi and ask a question uh, in real time. That would be super awesome. Um, okay. So maybe I'll, I'm actually going to go backwards. So uh, Fred is asking, any idea how the spring intrusions of Atlantic water are able to punch into the fjord despite the efforts of the Labrador Current and Fraser River to keep it out? That's a good question. And I, I personally don't know. I really, I and mean, this is the, all that I've learned about this system um, is, is what you see in this slide today. So it's a totally new region for me. It's, it's interesting that you bring that up because it, there's some sense from community members, and Joey Engnetuk raised this, that sometimes when the ice melts very early, the feeling in community is that this is because of relatively warm water coming in from offshore, um, potentially fresh, I guess, so sitting underneath the ice or being invected up towards the ice. So there's, that's, that's definitely something that could be of community interest and concern. Cool. Um, Let's see, there's a question here. Uh, we see large ranges in the near surface uh, water temperature and probably in the air temperature as well. Um, what guidance do you give uh, the community scientists about how long to do the CTD soak at the surface to equi equilibrate, I can speak so well, uh, the temperature or like the conductivity cell, things like that. Um, 
And is that based on air or water temperature, the equilibration? Yeah, so what, that's something that would need to be, I think, tested to come up with a good number. So you'd need to, to test what profiles look like after um, not letting them sit in the water and equilibrate. So we haven't done that to detail because otherwise it would be kind of pulling in a number out of nowhere. What, what we've endeavored to do is simply uh, keep the CTD in the case while traveling. And um, if it's a bit colder, you can use little hand, those little hand warmer things that you snack and they stay warm and that can keep things from being very cold. And then really minimize the time that the CTD is in the air. So the air, you know, the, the water's not gonna be any colder than minus two, but the air could be quite cold. So get that CTD in the water quite quick. Um, I would note that I haven't done this or been in, involved in any of this kind of work when it's much colder than a few degrees below zero though, because the spring weather we had was five, maybe it was minus 10 one day, but it was mostly not very cold. So that is a problem if you go in February. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so that that's typically our recommendation too. We know there's, um, we have some groups in the Western Arctic as well doing um, uh, community science work as well. And they, they keep theirs in a freezer with water, like for just fresh water inside of it. And that's how they can keep it, um, you know, around two degrees or, or um, yeah. Uh, what were the local community scientists' reaction to seeing the CTD data? Did anything in there surprise them or is it, was it confirming what they already know? Yeah, so unfortunately there hasn't been a good opportunity to bring this stuff back okay. to the community. So it hasn't, that was likely to happen this summer, let's say spring, summer, fall, but no one's going to be traveling from Halifax or from the south to isolated communities in the north. So unfortunately, there hasn't been a really good opportunity to talk about this stuff, to kind of bring it back. But in the context of the, the OFI Research Consortium that this is kind of moving into, so Chay Anderson, I mentioned her earlier, and, and others are explicitly involved in those projects as partners or hired on by the project. So even in the absence of being able to travel, we're going to have opportunities to um, to do outreach anyway, with people based locally that are that are um, involved in the project. And along those lines, this is from me. Um, what, like, have you started at the beginning? You mentioned, you know, it's a great way. It's a two-way conversation to have. So, have you worked with directly? I know you're from the area anyway, but like, have you worked directly with? Um, the folks who were there and like ask them like what the most important things they're interested or excited about that you're going to be measuring or like what what they'd like to see come out of the data. Yeah, so that like that that in the end is the pointy end I'd say of this whole thing and it's also the hardest thing in a way and so I mean what I've experienced is that if someone doesn't know what is, or hasn't seen a CTD, it's hard to have a conversation around what you can even measure. So it, the first thing is just to go out and measure it. And then you can talk about what you measured. And then there's kind of like a, you can kind of bootstrap your way through a conversation and then inf knowledge and information sharing can happen. So that's kind of what this pilot project was about. And when this started, the idea wasn't to do a main bay trans, the Strathcona transect. It was just to go up and see what was interesting. And just naturally we were drawn to the Fraser River. It's a char fishing region. Some of the people we were traveling with stopped to fish chars. We were going up the Fraser River. And so it just, it just seemed intuitively to be a region to focus on. And so then I think the next step of the conversation is, yeah, to talk about this data and see, see where to go. And I think what this is missing really so far is any kind of linking it with local knowledge and also local observations that aren't necessarily measured, let's put it that way. And so we're hoping with the next phase of this, which is part of that next project, to, to explicitly do those things. So to bring in the knowledge, whether it's been recorded previously or, or, or doing new recordings or, uh, of it, and also speak to people about what they've seen in the last season or the last year in terms of observations and try to coordinate everything so that we're identifying what is the, what is the best thing in the, in, this, in the ecosystem, let's call it, to measure. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine something like, um, you know, the, I'm sure the fishermen are so aware of the char migration patterns, like what time of year they're moving. And maybe um, if they had um, like a CTD observation before 
during and after that, that there might be a way to link like, oh, like when the temperature is this, the oxygen is this, um, you know, it relates to this, the chart doing something different than what we expected. So um, I see how it needs to be done to, together. It's not like you can just show them the data and say, well, what do you got, you know, it's a yeah, collaboration. There's, no, there's yeah, an incredible amount of knowledge that local people can give for, as you say, like seasonal cycle. I mean, when, yeah. when we were, when this bit was being planned, this was done in collaboration with another OFI project. So there's a whole set of other researchers trying to do other, other measurements at the same time, sort of semi-independently. Um, it was raised, well, when is the, when is the right time to come, right? When does the ice break? And I forget who it was mentioned. I think it's been Joey as well. You know, when the geese leave the south, you've got two weeks and the ice is going to break up and that's yeah. So that's a good indicator, right? You don't even look at a calendar, but it's like, it's an, e that's an ecosystem indicator for ice breaking. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> How do you plot that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need someone sitting down on the lake in the south watching you see when the geese fly away. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Um, I think I'm going to stop recording and then just carry on the conversation if people have any other uh, questions or anything. Again, I want to thank Eric. Thank you so much. This was really awesome. A reminder, next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, we're going to learn about the ice fin and at the other end of the world in Antarctica. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to leave the call on. And again, feel free to turn on your mics and your cameras. Um, if you want to chat, people. <laughs> <laughs>